It's no secret that Death Battle has been talked about on the internet quite a lot. But as much as other people love their fantastic fight scenes, usually, their charming editing style, normally, or even their whiz and boomstick moments, for the most part, others criticize them for supposedly always being wrong. When people are asked to elaborate on this, it's often pointed to a select number of episodes from the first three seasons, or an episode with that kind of fanbase. Yet despite so many anime fans bashing Death Battle for their favorite shonen getting shafted, there is one episode that unexpectedly swooped in to collect more vitriol than every controversial episode of the show. Ben Tennyson vs. Hal Jordan, aka the Green Lantern. You're probably not wondering why this episode is getting a dedicated video instead of being a part of my Season 6 ranking retrospective. I mean, surely this isn't the only Death Battle episode that I've talked about in length, and I don't think that this will be the last. But with those other examples, I was still able to focus on the episode and nothing else. Barring a few moments like with Mewtwo vs Shadow where I was able to interview the animator of that episode and get some misconceptions cleared up. But Ben 10 vs Green Lantern, however, I just could not bring myself to approach it without covering the internet's response to the episode and other parts of the aftermath. It's at a point where I felt like if I simply included it in the retrospective like any other episode, it would overshadow the rest of the season. I don't want that to happen because, uh, spoiler alert... Grass is green. Season 6 has some of the best episodes that Death Battle has ever made, with plenty of unadulterated passion throughout a good chunk of them. Ben 10 vs Green Lantern technically has that too, but the episode's aftermath is really interesting for me to talk about. It even allows me to talk about the community's reactions and the mindset some people have with Death Battle as a whole, as I feel like this episode perfectly encapsulates all of them. So with all of that in mind, I am not afraid to talk about this episode. And even if I was, this wouldn't be the first time I accidentally pissed off an entire subreddit. To be blunt, the fact that this is the most controversial episode of the entire show is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. When you consider the other infamous episodes, that title could have gone to Gata vs. Toph, Rogue vs. Wonder Woman, Yang vs. Tifa, Tracer vs. Scout, The Mistake, Dante vs. Bayonetta, Bowser vs. Ganondorf, Naruto vs. Ichigo, Ryu vs. Jin, either one of the Goku vs. Superman episodes, or at the very bare minimum, Mewtwo vs. Shadow. Hell, even Kirby vs Majin Buu or Ivy vs Orchid would have made more sense than this. But many people woke up and decided to dislike bomb the episode that features HAL, I can bullshit my way through anything with willpower, Jordan. I know why this episode is controversial, and I will be getting to that, but on the surface, the episode doesn't seem so bad aside from the fact that Ben lost. Yeah, there's an anti-feat involved, but Beast vs Goliath, the most famous example of Death Battle using an anti-feat, doesn't have nearly as many dislikes. So it really does feel like it stems from a shocking outcome and pretty much nothing else. Though to be fair, even the Death Battle team was surprised that Green Lantern won. But first, while I don't like reiterating things and repeating myself, I feel like with this episode in particular, I might as well remind people that versus debating is subjective. And if you adamantly claim otherwise, I already have your IP address. Regardless, I'm completely neutral on this debate. I still see people say that Ben wins, and others say that Hal wins, but for me, I'm just gonna redirect people to check out the G1 prediction blog for this episode specifically. You may eventually notice that Ben doesn't get a single vote in the prediction, and the blog gives a lot of reasons as to why, far more than what the average Death Battle episode is able to give. Although, unfortunately, a lot of their links are completely defunct. So, to any G1 bloggers, if this is possible to fix, please do it. Until then, I'll be linking an analysis by DeviantArt user SpiderPidge, which yeah, mostly covers Hal, but also addresses plenty of stuff about Ben. You don't have to believe everything that these say. I myself personally disagree with Hal being able to break into the Speed Force, and I also think that SpiderPidge kind of misinterpreted Echo Echo's actual limitations, but you should still read them and make your own decision from there. In terms of the Death Battle episode, I think it's important to analyze what it does right and wrong before getting into the aftermath. 
It's just to make it in line with my Death Battle Retrospective series, although I will be approaching it differently than the previous seasons. What I mean by this is that I normally try to avoid bringing in outside factors to my criticisms with episodes. Unless if it has something to do with story beats they get wrong in the analysis, inaccurate characterization in the fight, some extra context on scenes that they use as b-roll, etc etc. But as far as the versus side of things go, I don't like to say, oh the Death Battle episode is bad because they left out this feat, as that's not fair criticism. I can complain about Death Battle seemingly ignoring Pit's lightning dodging feats all I want, but it's not fair to criticize, let alone dock points from the episode because of it. I prefer criticizing Death Battle episodes for the content in them, but for Ben 10 vs Green Lantern, I'm gonna make an exception. Not that it's gonna affect my overall opinion of this episode, but just wait, you'll see why I'm doing this. Though I reckon this whole section is gonna get ignored by people still mauling over this episode, but if you really want a response from me that badly, all I'm gonna say is that the moment you start spewing the word bias is the moment that I invite you to remember that nobody is more biased than the person who accuses others of being biased while claiming to be objective or unbiased themselves. That's all I'm gonna say. Now, let's get into this episode and see if we can elaborate on all of those dislikes. Starting with the analyses, admittedly I have not gotten around to checking out Ben 10 series, and I am a BEYOND casual Hal Jordan enjoyer. I only say this because Jon Stewart is my goat. But the word I've heard from people who like these characters more than I do, Ben 10's analysis is mostly accurate to the source material. And I personally enjoyed it. Boomstick's bad rapping was endearing, especially when compared to another episode. And I also like the delivery of the Ben 1,912 bit. He just says it so quickly, I think it's funny. He's been 1,912! And they even include a brief but noticeable snippet of the instrumental version of Ben 10's theme song. And with the exception of One Winged Angel playing for a bit and Sephiroth vs. Virgil, Sonic's Drowning and Game Over themes playing for a couple of jokes, and maybe one or two other moments that I can't think of off the top of my head, this never happens in episodes that use royalty-free music. The cutaway gag that follows was okay, albeit predictable and with a cheap P joke. Though I am aware that this point they make about the Omnitrix scarring the user's DNA is a combination of random moments that involve Kevin Levin. Aside from that, I thought that there were other good quips like how they said Waka Trout is worse than an alien called the worst, and the upchuck gag was almost peak comedy except Wiz didn't even say that's right Boomstick. You know, you're right Boomstick. Seriously, just say it. Properly. But overall, given that Ben Singer is also a big fan of Ben 10, who would have thunk, I could definitely feel his love for the show in the script. There's a lot of passion to be had, and as an outsider of the series, I can appreciate that. But that being said, I thought that Hal's analysis was more enjoyable. Maybe it's because I know the character better, but they cover all sorts of fun facts, like the wackier members of the Green Lantern Corps, and some other facts about what the ring can do and how Hal has used it alongside the full extent of his willpower. They even have some good jokes here and there, with one of them including Wiz and Boomstick fist bumping each other. Impressible? Now make them kiss. Even the yellow elephant in the room caught me off guard, especially with the music cutting off to let the joke sink in. It's a lot of fun to revisit. Though I don't have as much to say as other episodes that also have gotten the fully scripted treatment from me, the fight definitely has more to talk about. We start the fight with XLR8 casually running through the streets when Hal stops him. Hello! Green Lantern, best looking guardian of Sector 2814, at your service. I can give you 10 good reasons right now to let me go! I've heard that this voice fits way better with Teenage Ben as opposed to Kid Ben, and given his appearance, okay, I can see it. But in their defense, there weren't a lot of good-looking Ben sprites to work with. Most of them either didn't match Enzo's Green Lantern sprites, or didn't look too good at all. Hell, the best sprites they could use for Ben were from a Ben 10 bootleg game on the Genesis and 32X. That is not a sentence I'd expect to hear myself say out loud. I still like NAL's performance, especially since he gets to flex his vocal range by voicing all of the aliens in distinct tones and dialects. Aside from Alien X, who occasionally dips into NAL's normal speaking voice. This is Alien X. He controls all of reality. This is over. But the clip I just played is probably the only one that comes across that way to me. Otherwise, props to NAL for his voice acting. Bradley Garrett's Hal Jordan is really good too. Maybe not among my favorite performances in the show, but definitely a high tier voice performance at minimum. No joke, I think that Bradley Garrett should at some point be considered for an official voice performance of Hal. Some of his standout lines in the fight include the supernova exchange with his honest and confused reaction making it my favorite part of the episode. Hey! You ever seen a supernova? Several, actually. I... 
and his last few lines in the end where he struggles to maintain his ego for a bit. Ew, I stepped in loser. <laughs> oh, it hurts to laugh. After the setup, we see the first alien transformation in this unique hand-drawn style, and of course, it looks really good. Special shoutouts to the veins popping out as its arms grow. It's kind of a pity that Forearms doesn't get to do too much aside from punching Hal's shield a little bit, but then Heat Blast shows up with an even better looking transformation. Let's stop this before it gets heated. Too late. The way that the fire completely evaporates the water from the fire hydrant complements the excellent hand-drawn animation that almost looks exactly like the sprites, until you notice the dynamic posing and the smear frames used in the transformation. And then you get Hal combating Heat Blast Fire with a construct of a fire extinguisher, followed by that supernova exchange that I outspokenly appreciate so much. And then what follows is a Grey Matter cameo. Cute. Followed by Wei Big's transformation, which is entirely hand-drawn, even during the mock kaiju fight with Hal's giant fists, which he quickly morphs into a giant moon and yeats it, causing Alien X to catch the moon, flick Hal into space, and... Okay, this is where the problems start to come into play, as Hal's shoulder gets smacked on a different layer in between shots. Okay. <laughs> Now, I guess that I can kind of understand why Alien X is so punchy, since I believe that his custom sprites are edited from the default MVC sprite style, not so dissimilar from Hal's and many other superheroes with custom sprites. But aside from time manipulation and existence erasure, all he does is throw hands. And no, I don't count the cloning, since the clones do nothing interesting aside from, again, throwing hands. But what I don't see a lot of people talking about is that Hal doesn't fight creatively either. He uses his constructs in fun ways earlier, but in space, all he really does is put up a barrier and forge a spear. And this may not sound so bad, but did you know that Hal can create clones of himself with his ring? I mean, sure, they're not as powerful as Hal, or even the Alien X clones if I remember correctly, but they could still provide a cool fight dynamic. And since both apparently have time travel abilities, why not have a scene where Hal sends Alien X back in time to the first Thanksgiving, but he just rewinds himself back to the the fight. And speaking of traveling, Hal goes back to the beginning of the fight, cuts off Ben's arm with some slow moving scissors, and then starts playing the Boomer has it. Boomer has it. Boomer has it. I couldn't resist the song's a banger. Weird execution aside, I like how they had Hal attempt this after the pulse from the Omnitrix. It's not talked about in the episode, but in the QA, they said that the pulse has a cooldown and Hal would be able to exploit it if he knew about it. Well, in the context of the fight, Hal did know about the pulse and capitalized on it, so nice attention to detail. However, Ben's hero time has a forced cutoff before the scissors slice his arm off. It's hero time! I don't know about you, but I think this makes the impact worse, especially with this pause afterwards being spiral levels of comical. I'll give the kill some creativity points since explosion deaths have been done numerous times before, and I can understand why they didn't want to have three of those in a row, but if the death really needed to be like this, I'd like to share my take on how I would improve this. First two bits to try to take this, it's hero time! <laughs> Now it has some impact, so Ben's pause makes more sense in context as it would give the viewer a moment to let this sink in. And on top of that, it better shows that Hal is faster than the failsafe can react, and since I've removed that stupid cutoff, the delivery feels more effective. I mean, it would have been cool if Ben used the failsafe to transform into someone like Diamond Head to resist the scissors, and then Hal used one last construct to break through Diamond Head or have Alien X also show up, forcing Hal to deal with both of them. Then maybe his other self joins in on the fight as well, but that's asking for a bit much. And yeah, that's all I have to say for the fight, so let's talk about the last thing people remember about this episode. Emerald Heroes is a pretty good track, even if they once again forget to credit Daniel Vanson Galvin as a singer. Oops. It highlights the animation's key moments incredibly well, most notably in the transformation scenes, it has an ethereal feel to it, and it contains an incredible guitar solo. <laughs> However, I don't understand some of the lyrics. The Emerald Crown thing makes sense. If I remember correctly, this is a Green Lantern reference. But I'm schizophrenic, I'm not schizophrenic, there's tens of me, but I swear we're not schizophrenic, maybe? Uh, is this supposed to be a Ben 10 thing? The tens of me makes me think it is, but does Ben have schizophrenic? Ah, oh, well, I'm still a sucker for vocals that play on the offbeats. And yeah, I don't have that much to say, so let's talk about that conclusion. 
So, what they needed to do was say that Hal is able to kill omnipotent beings, you know, like Mandrak, for example, and say that he was about 750 times faster at minimum. But instead, their first argument is that Ben could only access one alien at a time, while Hal had access to all of his options at once. Okay, that's pretty accurate. But then they say that Ben was always playing catch-up. But the animation had Hal reacting to Ben's transformation, so this is a wrong statement by the animation's logic. But that's not the part that got people angry. They also attempt to do a soft debunk of Universal Alien X by saying, Like the time Alien X recreated the universe. He only did that because he couldn't stop it from being destroyed in the first place. When earlier in Ben's rundown, they said, His durability was so through the roof, he didn't even realize total cosmic annihilation was happening right on top of him. Okay, look. You guys can debate this all you want, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change the fact that Alien X still recreated the f***ing universe! What kind of point are you trying to make and why?! Oh, but they still talk about the universal and multiversal scaling into Blink and They'll Be Gone black boxes that not everyone notices. And there's also this one that brings up the U-Bomb, making him 10 times stronger than Alien X. Uh, what the f***? is a U-bomb. Would have been nice to have seen some proof of that. I have no evidence for this, but something tells me that they forgot to mention this in the original script, so they just shoehorn these black boxes in here once they realize that their argument doesn't fully add up. That's just a hunch, but would it surprise you if it was true? But they make other points, like how Hal is able to resist X's mind manipulation, time manipulation, and existence erasure. I know that's true, but they just choose not to show the scans for some reason. I know you have them, Gerardo! Where are they? And yeah, Hal's analysis mentions Kyle holding back the Big Bang, and they mention Kilowog surviving the crisis of Infinite Earths, even if they forgot to mention other Green Lanterns talking about how they remember surviving it, which includes post-crisis Hal remembering events that happened in pre-crisis, by the way. They still bring it up in the analysis, just not in the conclusion. Yeah, people who watch both character rundowns will remember that, but that doesn't mean Death Battle should leave it out of the conclusion entirely. And their final argument is that Alien X has shown no resistance to those same effects. That's a nice argument, wizard. Why don't you back that up with a sword? That's right, Boomstick. Okay, that makes sense. I've also heard that Alien X can resist these effects because of uh, something something Sotobro effect. Although I have heard people say that that's not how the Sotobro effect actually works. Look, if you want to know what I think, you're asking the wrong guy. Either way, it would have been nice to hear what their interpretation of it would have been. And this is where we start getting into the conversation of Death Battle episodes not using sufficient research. And, uh, spoiler alert, this will not be the last time in the series where we have this conversation, but this is easily the best moment to have it. Say whatever you want about the Q&A and how good or bad those arguments were. They did provide arguments and scans that should have been in the episode, like how Hal is faster than the failsafe, and Hal's ring also having a failsafe that happens to be better than the Omnitrix's. I think the Q&A is informative and a much better showcase of Hal's victory than the actual episode, but it still has some problems. Personally, I think that Jet Ray should have had its speed calced. Yeah, I know that he moves through hyperspace, but they still could have calced its movement within hyperspace and where he ends up. Especially since they argue that anyone with massively faster than light speed should be fast enough to stop themselves on a dime unless if there's something that states otherwise. So they should have applied that same standard to Jet Ray. Then again, Alien X is way faster than Jet Ray regardless, so who cares? And I was also surprised that they never addressed X's resistance to mind, time, and existence manipulation, as well as how good they are in comparison to Hal's. And it would have been nice if they showed some B-roll of Ben's ability limitations, notably the pulse cooldown that they talk about. But they do say that his constructs are way faster than the Omnitrix's failsafe. I won't spoil the number, but take a look at the number they give for Mega Man.exe speed. Hal's constructs actually move way faster than that. I'm serious, there's a calc for it, go look it up. <laughs> All in all, this conclusion is what made people dislike Bomb the episode. Not so much that Ben lost, but because it was explained so poorly. I mean, the Q&A also got dislike bombed, and the podcast episode before that one also got dislike bombed just because they didn't have the Q&A ready. Because I guess no one on YouTube has any basic social awareness. But with the episode, I consider the absence of these points in the conclusion to be a major failing of the episode. This might not bother some people as much, and that's cool, but I've said this before, you can make what 
whatever argument you want. Just make sure it adds up with what you say and what feats you believe, along with where you scale them. This episode is technically correct by its own logic, but it's presented so poorly that it barely matters. And while it didn't bother me that much, it definitely bothered Ben 10 fans, even the ones who think Hal Jordan does win. But I say that it's a pretty solid episode overall. Not one of my all-time favorites, but I can still say it's cool. Although we're not done yet. Nah. It didn't feel right just to analyze this episode and give my opinion on it. I want to go deeper. Death Battle may have had controversial verdicts and poorly written conclusions in the past. Why is this episode considered to be more controversial than all of them, possibly combined? Well, there are some nuances to this. To begin with, DC was already on a massive winning streak, literally the biggest one in Death Battle history with seven, beginning with Raven beating Twilight Sparkle in the second episode of Season 5, and ending with Lobo getting bored by Zarathos in the tenth episode of Season 6. If you hear any salty sea dog claiming that Death Battle is biased towards DC, chances are this win streak would come to their mind. Unless if they're referring to Goku vs Superman, but given that DC characters literally never won until that episode, you can feel free to disregard their ENTIRE EXISTENCE. To people who have become more recent fans of Death Battle, this winning streak was notorious back in the day. These characters didn't just win, they often curb stomped their opponent, be it by the episode's logic or in general. <laughs> if people didn't start thinking Death Battle was biased towards DC, they sure as hell got people to think that DC characters were busted. Not only that, but I feel like a lot of people People tend to underestimate how much impact Death Battle has had on internet culture. Whenever the show introduces a new series or brings back an old series after so many years, especially if it features the main character or a popular character, it gets people talking. Whether the response is generally positive, negative, or Roshi vs Jiraiya is the worst matchup they've ever done with Madara vs Aizen being a close second. Ooh, ooh, now that... <laughs> that is a very interesting opinion, Mr. Reddit, but... Is your mental health okay? There are literally millions of people that get excited. And for people who are already fans of Death Battle but not super familiar with the characters being used, chances are they'll spend the waiting periods checking out that series for the first time and trying to get to know the characters better. But when Ben 10's episode got announced, it didn't just get people talking, it practically revived the fandom itself. The reboot was the last official Ben 10 related thing ever, and Cartoon Network was doing that series pretty dirty in general. Not to mention that there is one person who has helped the Ben 10 community flourish during this period. Kudo the Artist, or as you may prefer calling him, the Ink Tank. Yep, I'm going there. I've been known that the Death Battle community really doesn't like this guy. I've even seen a disappointingly high amount of people compare him to the likes of Seth the Beta Male. No! And even if you randomly feel like gaslighting yourself into thinking that the controversy never happened, I would still say not even half a percent close. Let's be real, none of his content was ever that good. It was very simple and boring versus debater jargon. And sure, he might have had good production value, but none of that is credited to him because he can't make a decent video to save his life. Unless if your definition of a decent video is slapping an unedited JPEG on screen and letting it sit there for several minutes straight. But I digress. Kuro is a great man with talent and a far more worthwhile existence than little Sethi. He makes all sorts of mostly high quality videos about the Ben 10 series, and he also has a webcomic called Five Years Later. Never read it myself because it doesn't seem like my kind of thing, but I've heard that the comic is pretty awesome from people across multiple fandoms. I'm not blaming Kuro for the Death Battle episode receiving so much controversy. I always exclusively blame toxic keyboard warriors with no social awareness. But I do credit Kuro for his positive influences in the Ben 10 community, helping it stay as big as it is today. However, I can't deny that his videos on the death battle did blow up in popularity and were where many people first heard of him, myself included. Those views are, let's just say, a bit more than the average death battle debunk video. And of course, it does gather people who look at the thumbnail and assume that it's good just because a debunk exists. Well, sorry for not feeling sorry, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I think that all three of 
Kudo's videos f***ing suck. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I could have put at least a little bit of sugar on there. But I don't say this with any malicious intent. I feel like far more people have been attacking Kudo's character over this than necessary. All he did was give his opinion on a YouTube video from 2019. As far as debunks go, this was likely the most professional one I've seen alongside Leopold's response to Ryu vs. Jin. And contrary to what the Death Battle community randomly feels like thinking, he still respects the Death Battle team and the work that they put in. He just wanted to give his opinion on the episode and leave it at that. I still wanted to cover his trilogy because I want to make an attempt to explain why you should never automatically believe debunks at face value. You can disagree with them just as much as you can disagree with Death Battle itself. Assuming you're constructive and civil, of course. I don't acknowledge people who act toxic for no reason, but for Kudo's trilogy, I'm not gonna be talking about most of his Alien X scaling. In 2022, he made a video scaling Alien X, and I recommend that you give it a watch. It's honestly one of, if not the best, Ben 10 power scaling videos out there. Maybe he does still stand by everything he said in these videos from a Versus standpoint. I couldn't tell you. I never planned to criticize his scaling in the first place. Like I said, Versus debating is subjective. Kudo has the right to scale Ben, Hal, and Alien X as high as he wants to. So I would prefer criticizing these videos for other fundamental issues that make the trilogy fail as an actual debunk. Although I'm not going to be referring to his first video that much. It's mainly an unscripted hype train video, where he tries to come up with some feats that could give Ben the win without Alien X. But it's harmless! He does go into some facts about the Ben 10 lore that the death battle covered, along with some less imperative tidbits that were still cool to learn about. He also just seems really happy that death battle had Ben 10 on the show at all. But the second video is odd for me to talk about. A good chunk of his criticisms were things that I already pointed out in my analysis of the episode, but there are still a few problems that I need to point out. To begin with, he just outright ignores Hal's stats. I'm not talking about any outside factors I brought up or stuff that was mentioned in the Q&A. I mean that nothing he brought up for Alien X is better than Hal being 1.5 quintillion times the speed of light, 10 times universal, or proficient against other omnipotent beings like Mandrak. And he doesn't bring any new quantifiable feats to the table. I know that I said all of this were in black boxes that are blank and they're gone, but Kuro knows that these black boxes exist because he screen caps one of them. And I I know that his goal was to prove that they were lowballing Ben and misunderstanding him from a versus standpoint, but at the same time, how was he able to tell that they weren't lowballing the winner either? Death Battle has done this multiple times before and since. Hell, the very next episode lowballs Persona characters to town level and Mach 3. The multi debunks is saying that Hal's recharge isn't instantaneous, and that's true, but Death Battle knows that as well, saying that it takes 10 seconds to fully charge and that a full charge can last up to 24 hours. It does carry a finite charge, and should he expend too much energy too quickly, he'll need his power battery to refuel. Brightest day and blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power! Yes, he does bring up how Albedo was Alien X for an entire year, but he doesn't bring up any scans or proof of that. Though I did look into the feat, and even with the context, that is a bold claim to be making. You can't just say that and automatically assume that everyone is going to think you're right. And he also says that Alien X is able to resist time manipulation, mind manipulation, and the like, but he doesn't try to compare it with Hal's. He's more interested in showing footage of the episode than footage of the points he's trying to make. Hey, this is starting to sound really familiar now that I think about it. Another minor issue I have is when he says that Forearms shattered Hal's shield in the beginning, despite the fact that Forearms doesn't actually do that. Not sure where he got the idea that Hal's shield was broken here given the sound effect it plays. But that's pretty pedantic of me. The video still ended on a decently positive note, saying that he was happy to see Ben on Death Battle even if his representation needed improvement. And you know what? Fair enough. But then there's his final video, and this video is easily the most disappointing one of the trilogy. In his response to the Q&A, he first talks about the animation doesn't matter argument and explains why it's a load of bollocks. Thank you! I've been saying this! Even back in Season 1, their conclusions were directly based on the animations! When a point in their verdict contradicts the animation, that is a fault of the conclusion! Sure, it may not always bother me, but it's usually difficult to ignore. The rebuttal only applies to smaller moments in the animation, like when Sora used Stopka instead of Reflect to deal with Pit's projectiles. The rebuttal can be used because it doesn't change the fact that Sora's arsenal of magic was one of Sora's key advantages. I also think that the rebuttal should be used when telling a bunch of salty sea dogs to calm the f*** down and put their hate boners away for five minutes. Because Death Battle is meant to be entertaining above all else. Thanks for validating me, Cuckoo. 
I still think that the way you presented the argument is disingenuous. This is based off of a hunch and an even bigger assumption than the one I brought up for the death battle episode, so I'm just gonna put this all here. Yes, that is a lot of words, and yes, you are gonna be reading all of that, but you're gonna need to pause the video right now because if you don't, it's gonna get cut off. <laughs> what did I tell you? However, at the end of the day, Kuro mostly mentions this as a means of contextualizing what happens when you take the animation doesn't matter, it's just entertainment rhetoric at face value. I just think that his wording was unclear in that regard, and this probably doesn't matter that much because his main goal was dissecting the Q&A, so let's see how he does this. This presentation is more biased towards defending Green Lantern. Ah yes, the best strategy. When you can't come up with a half-decent argument to save your life, just accuse the other person of being biased and act as if you're showing no bias whatsoever. Thank you, Cuckoo. Very cool. He only brings up three arguments. One is elaborating on the Sotobro effect and what he says it actually is. One is mentioning that the scissor thing came from an inexperienced Ben. And one says that Hal's ring could still come off despite the example Liam brought up was from an inexperienced Hal Jordan. Even though the Q&A goes over how Hal's ring also has a failsafe and Kuro doesn't give any more evidence to suggest Hal's ring could still be taken off or how Ben could bypass the ring's failsafe. Oops. I probably know more about Hal Jordan than Death Battle knows about Ben Tennyson. That's a nice argument, Cuckoo. Why don't you back that up with a source? That's right, Boomstick. Okay, that makes sense. But other than that, he goes into saying why Death Battle is being biased here. His reasons being that Liam used scans from other lanterns and different versions of Hal Jordan. Uh, what different versions? Pre-crisis and post-crisis? Well, that can't be right because the episode establishes that Hal survived the crisis like other lanterns did. Is it post-crisis in New 52? No, that composite is actually canon. This is not Death Battle's Hal Jordan. This is pre-Flashpoint Hal Jordan, which they've been using for nearly every other DC character, almost if they try to prove that they get pre-crisis scaling. But he does have his reasons as to why he doesn't address many of Green Lantern's feats and abilities. He claims that there are lots of videos and articles about Hal, but almost none about Ben. Let's see how true that is. Here's a debunk video all about Ben. And here are two more debunk videos about Ben. Here's a debunk article about Ben that mostly cites your video, yes, but still has its own things to say. Here's the G1 prediction blog, which covers both characters and their article on Hal being incredibly broken. Here's Spider Pidge's article that I also mentioned earlier. Here's this character rundown on Comic Vine. Here's this Quora page with dozens of comments saying how broken he is. Here's a WordPress article about Ben and his aliens. Here's another article power scaling Ben's aliens. And here is Ben's page on sites like Versus Battles Week Wiki, character level wiki, and more. If there really is that much more about Hal than Ben, okay fair, but to say that there's hardly anything about power scaling Ben is just untrue. So the third biggest disappointment of this video is that Kudo fails to understand why there seems to be a heavy emphasis on Hal Jordan feats. Because there were so many people who went in with the assumption that Alien X stomped Hal into the dirt. And even Liam himself thought this as well. Right, I so thought Ben 10 would win. When I I, going into switch. this, yeah. I thought that the, the same. Yeah. I was expecting this to end the streak. And I mean this with no offense, but I feel like a good chunk of people who watched Death Battle did not know that much about how powerful Hal Jordan was. And like you said, they needed to stick with their argument. So of course there'd be a heavy emphasis on the winner. And honestly, there were a bunch of people who were downplaying Hal because of uh, logic reasoning and lack thereof. I mean, what else am I supposed to think? I do think that they could have used better scans. Instead of showing another lantern where it's implied they can do time travel, they could have shown a scan where Hal actually does time travel. Or the other scans I mentioned with Hal himself remembering events from before Crisis and where he's able to use his ring to send others to a different point in time. But at the same time, when they consider every factor, they really did have to consider every factor and how the Green Lantern ring was able to resist Alien X's hacks. Oh, but sure, let's take the piss out of it for no reason and assume Liam is biased just because he thinks Green Lantern wins. Yeah, 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 he has his reasons and I'll tackle them in a bit, but given the weirdly negative tone that I'm getting from this video for some reason, how else am I supposed to interpret this? Yes, I do like Ben 10 more, but I am not biased towards him when facts are involved. Well, he's giving facts and you're just saying that he's being biased for it. Are you sure you're not showing any bias yourself? Though he does claim to be a huge DC fan, which I don't deny in the slightest. But here is the second biggest disappointment that I got from this video. You notice how the stuff I brought up mostly just covered one character or the other? This would have been another opportunity to power scale both combatants, and given how many views his initial analysis got, I think a lot of people would have liked to have seen him do this. Or at least I would have 
have liked it, but he doesn't do that. Yeah, he brings up the fact that Ben's other aliens can supposedly beat Hal before Alien X is even considered, but at this point, I think he knows that Death Battle is trying to argue that Hal stat stomps every single one of Ben's aliens aside from Alien X. And just like in his previous video, the most he says is that Ben is vaguely stronger and faster than Death Battle gave him credit for, but he still doesn't give anything quantifiable or anything comparable to what Death Battle gave Hal. While every other debunk I've seen, good and bad, doesn't just directly tackle Death Battle's arguments and logic, but they also bring in various quantifiable factors, not just scans, but they also give numbers for them and explain why Death Battle interpreted this feat incorrectly. Kuro doesn't do that in any of his three videos. He just says, oh, but this alien can do this and that, but he doesn't elaborate on why it's better than Hal. Maybe he didn't intend to make his videos full on debunks, but why would you entertain the idea of your video being a debunk if you're not even trying to debunk that much from a versus standpoint? I'm neutral on this debate, but would have been super interested to hear your point of view. Why can I not have it? Well, that's probably because of this next point he tries to make. Kuro goes into detail on why compositing characters is a bad thing. And he's also assuming that scaling him to other lanterns is also compositing him, despite the fact that no, it's not. I get that scaling in verses is a galaxy-sized black hole of worms, and I actually do plan on talking about this later on in the ranking retrospective. But to say that it's the same thing as compositing is straight up wrong. Oh, but sure, go on and make a fully composited Ben 10, pretend that it's fair, and manipulate the situation to where the viewer comes across as by it. Shut up, man. You're supposed to be better than this. Act your age. Oh, and by the way, for those who want to know what fully compositing Hal actually looks like. In fact, if you composited both of them, then Hal becomes the most powerful incarnation of the Spectre aside from the Oversoul itself, and that's not something Ben wants to be fighting. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. But you want to know what really set me off? This moment right here which I consider to be the biggest disappointment of the whole video, and even the trilogy itself. In conclusion, I've surmised that I would rather Death Battle not even have touched the character. <sighs> really? You really just made me do the YouTuber sigh. You ended off two videos with how happy you were that Ben got some exposure. But now, you say that they shouldn't have even touched the character in the first place. I think I can understand where you're coming from. Not only were you mildly frustrated with parts of the Q&A, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was amped up by the amount of people demanding you to talk about it. Despite my issues with how you've displayed your opinions, I respect them, and I respect you. But while re-watching your analysis of the episode, I actually kept track of the number of pros and cons you listed. Sure, it may look like there were at least a few more cons than pros, but then you look at this direct quote I wrote down. I had no problems with the recap. I had no problems with the recap. No problems with the recap. No problems no problems, no problems. I know that not everyone cares about the analyses, even though they should, and Kuro states that he's one of the people who exclusively watches Death Battle for the animations. But the character rundowns literally make half of every Death Battle episode. Ignoring them while proclaiming that the episode is bad is a really dishonest way of criticizing it. And even with the fight, while he did have issues with the ending and Alien X's representation, he still enjoyed nearly everything else about it. He even said that Ben's writing and characterization were spot on and applauded NAL's voice acting for being accurate to the source material. And while he disagreed with the entire conclusion, that's less than two and a half minutes of a 21 minute video. It's fine to dislike the episode for the cons you listed, but if you technically enjoyed the majority of the video, don't you think it's a bit much to say that Death Battle shouldn't have even touched the character in the first place? Despite Ben Singer being a big fan of Ben 10, did it really bother you that much? Something tells me no, because I'm happy to say that Kuro never had it out for Death Battle. Whether or not he enjoys the series, he still gives respect to the team for the work they put in. But listen, I did not decide to cover Kuro's trilogy just to say I didn't like these videos. I did this because I wanted to lead into this one question that's been on my mind ever since I've been making this series. And this question is not rhetorical, it is a direct question to people who dislike Death Battle. Why do you care about the verdict so much? There's this idiosyncratic implication that a Death Battle episode would magically be infinitely better if the other character won. I've always loathed this notion, but my reasons for why are complex. I wouldn't say it's unrelatable or even unreasonable. It can be frustrating when your favorite character dies on Death Battle, and even worse when the character you were betting on doesn't win. Which by the way, that's happened to me three times in season 10 so far. It's perfectly fair to disagree with an episode's outcome and criticize it for whatever reason as long as you're being civil about it. But let me repeat that last part, as long as you're being civil. 
Unfortunately, not everyone's like that. Not only do some people say that an episode is bad just because of its verdict, but every episode of Death Battle is bad or wrong because of the verdict of one specific episode. Whether it's something like Gara lost to Toph or Ryu beat Jin or whatever. I've always thought this to be a really shallow way of looking at things. At the risk of sliding down a big slope, it gives me some bad vibes. Just picture, if you will, a timeline where Ben beat Hal, but he didn't use any of his aliens, he got bodied the entire time until he pulled a win out of his ass, without Alien X by the way, it had a personality like Ludger Kresnik from Tales of Exilia 2, where he's silent, serious, and socially awkward. Would you really say that the episode is good just because he won? And going into my personal experiences, I think that Ragnar vs. Soul has the correct verdict, but why should I like an episode that went out of its way to insult me for liking a video game series, using another character I really like as a vessel to hammer in that insult, and not even bother making the animation feel like the two characters are fighting one another? Hell, I even agree with the outcomes of other episodes I dislike, such as both of Season 4's low points, and those feature two of my all-time favorite characters winning, but I still don't like those episodes at all. The former for having poor use of NBC3 voice clips and sound design so bad that it actively breaks my immersion throughout pretty much the entire fight, and the latter where my favorite character doesn't even act like himself at any point. And I openly disagree with the outcome of Dante vs. Bayonetta, but it's still in my top 5 favorite episodes of the show because of its enticing animation and entertaining analyses. Why should I care about the verdict of all else when there are so many more relevant factors that determine my enjoyment of an episode. But if you yourself insist that the verdict matters above all else, okay, but how come I don't see you applying that same standard to many other faulty conclusions? I understand why people criticize Death Battle thinking that Godoid loses to Toph. It's honestly kind of a meme at this point. But I don't even think it's the worst conclusion in the series. I used to think it was Yang vs Tifa, but I wouldn't even say that. The worst conclusion easily goes to Guts vs Nightmare. The episode's verdict is literally just, yeah, Nightmare's more powerful than Guts in every conceivable way, but Guts just wins because logic, reasoning, and lack thereof. Oh, and he should also resist mind control and solar racing that's powerful enough to infect an entire army at once because, uh, he really, really loves his Dragon Slayer sword. Where was the outcry for that episode? And if you say it was because that's a season 2 episode, guess which episode is even older than that? The Death Battle team has publicly changed their minds on the verdict of a couple of other episodes, most notably Yang vs Tifa, which a lot of people still think was rigged because they wanted to appeal to Rooster Teeth so badly. Much like the claim that Ben Singer went against the research team's opinion on Dante vs Bayonetta, there was never any evidence of it. Though you might say Ben 10 vs Green Lantern in particular is a more recent Death Battle episode that claims to use better research. Well, even a modern death battle episode like Winter Soldier vs Red Hood can be wrong by their own logic. Sure, it may be the correct verdict, but they give Jason actual feats and they don't give Bucky anything. Yet that episode isn't getting dislike bombed. Not saying it should, but it didn't happen despite having a worse conclusion than Ben 10 vs Green Lantern. Then again, I may be misunderstanding a larger factor that nobody wants to tell me. And of course, I'm not trying to say that you should magically become a Death Battle fan because I disagree with your line of thinking. Speaking as a fan of the show, there are several valid reasons for criticizing and even disliking Death Battle. I just simply wish more people would use them. Is that so wrong? Could've put what in his comic?!